Steve Love. He's the CEO of the Dallas Fort Worth Hospital Council and uh, based, of course, out of the DFW Metroplex. Steve, how are you? Doing great, DJ. Thanks for having me. And I'm delighted to be on such a panel with people like Kim and Eric. Tell us how, how things are going in the, the Metroplex. Your hospitals have been hit hard. How? Give us an update on how things are being handled. Yeah, the, the hospitals got hit really hard here in North Texas during the last two years. I'm very proud, though, of how our hospitals all cooperate together, have shared resources, shared staff, PPE, et cetera. We had some really tough surges and waves that we went through. But the good news, as you touched on, Omicron is really coming down. It's less than 10% of our bed capacity now, our Omicron patients. So we're very excited about that. One of the things, though, that we're really watching, and remember, this is Texas. I know you've got people from across the nation. We still have 40% of people that are not fully vaccinated. So our real goal is to continue to educate, educate, educate people to please get vaccinated. How, um, you know, Texas, I think of as a state that has divisions between its cities and its more rural areas, the the legislature and the governor are sometimes working in close coordination with the healthcare system. Sometimes they're working a little bit across purposes. How, how would you um, explain for people outside of Texas how the healthcare politics rest in Texas these days? Well, you know, a couple of things. If you're talking non-COVID, we're still one of the states that has not expanded Medicaid, and we have the highest uninsured rate in the nation. So that's very problematic. I will say, though, during this pandemic, the state uh, has really worked the Health and Human Services Department closely bringing in outside staffing, bringing in travel nurses from outside the state, doing everything they could to help us. And for that, we're very appreciative. We're going to be over the next 30 days phasing out that supplemental staffing but the state has been critical in working with us during this pandemic. But as we look to the future, we do have some legislative items, some policy items around coverage access that we need to address. I know that uh, not everyone knows this, but in the almost Ebola pandemic that hit the U.S., it wasn't a pandemic because uh, while Ebola came to our shores and landed at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, uh, Parkland and the Dallas community kept that at bay and, and solved quite, a, uh, kept the rest of us safe. What, what lessons do you think that you learned from the Ebola experience that have been, you know, employed? What, what lessons did you learn from the Ebola experience that were employed in this COVID experience, do you think? Well, a couple of things, and we still need to improve, but we really learned during Ebola, when you look at federal, state, and local regulations, many times they were not in sync. There were some that were out of kilter. Even the different counties through their public health departments had different rules and regulations. We helped streamline some of that. But even in COVID, we learned many of the post-acute players who do an excellent job had different rules, different regulations, how many times a patient had to be tested, et cetera. So there's still work to be done so that we streamline that and we remove, for lack of a better term, some of the red tape. What do you think uh, are the, you've got a, a mix of for-profit public hospitals like Parkland, some, some for-profit hospitals. Um, has the pandemic impacted those hospitals differently? Has the response been different across the, the different uh, types of hospitals and how, if so? You know, that's a great question, and that's where the hospital council, all of those hospitals are members of the hospital council. And even though we support the Texas uh, Hospital Association, we have 7 million people, almost 8 million people now in the Metroplex, and healthcare is delivered locally. They really came to the table, worked together. We had routine meetings with chief medical officers, chief nursing executives, system CEOs, Everyone was on the same page, cooperated, 
And you would not have known if it was an investor owned or a public or a faith based hospital because they were all working together and doing things that would help the community. So, how do you think COVID will have changed healthcare in particularly North Texas? What, what will be different in your neck of the woods after we get through this period? I think a, a couple of things, and I've already been meeting with some of the HHS officials here in Region 6. You know, we learned some lessons, uh, and I'm going to get a little bit in the weeds, especially with Omicron. We had a lot of people show up at the EDs, and all they wanted was to be tested. Uh, there was no other reason to be there. Well, as you know, and you can talk to any provider attorney, they get real nervous when you mention Mtala. And so we worked with our local Region 6 to put up signage to direct people, if you're only here for testing, there are public test sites that we recommend you go to. Or we even set up test sites on other parts of the campus because our EDs were just flooded. That's one thing we learned. Another thing we learned is we've really got to focus on the short-term and long-term needs of our workforce. One of the tragedies related to the coronavirus early on had nothing to do with COVID-19. It had to do with people that were afraid to come to the hospital. They were afraid to call 911. We had people dead on arrival from heart attacks and strokes for fear of coming to the hospital. We've got to do a better job of educating people, getting the public health message out. I think the other thing that's really come from this that's good, a much closer working relationship with our post-acute care partners, whether it be skilled nursing, long-term acute care, et cetera. So from that, I think some real positives have come. And I think our chief medical officers have really done a good job of sharing some of the best clinical information across all the systems that'll benefit the patients. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, I believe that there are no active mitigation measures in place in the state of Texas, meaning no mask mandates. I think they're illegal, frankly. There's no uh, vaccine requirement back to normal. Is that accurate? Yeah, there's no real vaccine mandate, except some of the hospitals did. And as you know, even the Supreme Court did allow that. So some of the hospitals do have vaccine mandates. Uh, many of the systems, some of the states supported a kind of in an awkward position. They just have to encourage and educate their people. As far as mask mandates, uh, there is no global mask mandate, although some independent school districts did mandate mask. Uh, and there's been a lot of political pressure both ways. We've, we've had 10 superintendent of schools uh, retire in the last six months. And I think part of it was just focused on this mask mandate uh, struggle that we've had. So the, as, as people from outside of Texas look to Texas and try to divine and understand lessons or things to take away from the experience of COVID in Texas, what counsel or lessons learned, you know, what would you advise people watching uh, to take from the Texas, Texas experience as they move forward? I think one, you have to be a good listener. You have to listen to your health policy experts, whether it be at the federal and state level, and be a good listener so that you can really knock down some of those barriers so that you have uh, really a health policy that checks the boxes at the federal level, state level, and local level. So good listener. Number two, you've got to be nimble. And I'll really commend the clinical people in the North Texas hospitals or how nimble they were. Early on in the pandemic, they were talking to their colleagues in New York and they learned you don't have to vent every patient. Uh, they learned some of the techniques. They talked to people that they had uh, communication with overseas in Europe on best practice. So I think being very nimble to do that. And I think the other thing is coordination, especially around supply chain and coordination around staffing in any public health emergency is just critical. So we learned a lot. I'm proud of what our hospitals did. We got pushed to the limit 
but we came through for the community. Steve Love, CEO of the Dallas Fort Worth Hospital Council, sir. Thanks for making time. I appreciate it. Thank you, DJ. And by the way, I thought Hugh Grant was a good prime minister. <laughs> As did I, sir. As did I. Next up, we have Kim Bimstuffer. She's the director of Colorado's Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing. Kim, thank you for making time. I appreciate it. Hey, DJ, really nice to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. And yeah. uh, thank you for your le continued leadership. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Kim. So let me ask you, uh, give us a state of play or give us a rundown of how things are going in Colorado vis-a-vis -vis COVID. So everything's going the right way. Uh, as Steve said, um, Infections are down, the spread is down, the hospitalizations are down. Um, we did unfortunately uh, cross last week 12,000 deaths uh, here in Colorado, so that's devastating. But our economy is uh, really picked up and you know we continue to be the leading economy in the country and so people are finding jobs and uh, I think everything's going the right way. We're very, very grateful for where we are right now in Colorado and for the leadership we have here. Governor Jared Polis is, uh, I think, out on the front edge of some Democratic uh, governors in terms of moving to end some of the, or many, all of the mitigation uh, uh, strategies that have been in place. Give us a sense of the sort of values and the, the thinking that has gone into this transition that Colorado is making. Sure. So um, we have a very bold governor, and he's been um, you know, on the front line of this, never once hid behind a pillar, out in front. Uh, leading, having the best advisors around him, spending time uh, with his cabinet and the best science scientists and letting science uh, speak. Um, and so, you know, whether he was in the front line trying to get vaccines into the state or PPE in the state or making sure the hospitals were doing the right thing, coordinating daily meetings with hospitals, he's been on the front line. Um, so he's done an outstanding job of leading, educating, public service announcements because the, to Steve's points, this mask issue and the politics that got into this has been ridiculous. You know, you, you shouldn't get vaccinated or not depending on your political party. Um, this is the lives we're talking about here. And somehow politics got into this, but he just kept messaging and messaging to everybody, um, everybody. And, uh, but he also stepped, has always said that local control has to dominate. So massive education, um, getting the resources out, state leadership, state making sure everybody could get tested or vaccinated or access to PPE. So state control and leadership, but local control. So when um, the downturn started and we feel that um, we're probably in a pretty good shape before we have surges and infections again until the fall, that he wants people to live their lives, come to Colorado, come ski, come hike. Uh, and he said, you know, the, this, that we're, we're over the hump. It's behind us now. Now we have to move from pandemic to endemic, which means live your life. You are vaccinated and your family's vaccinated. Get out there, live your life. Uh, let's get the economy going. Let's get people out of the state of isolation. Let's get people um, healthy again uh, through this, this, this trauma that we've been through as a society and help people get healthy again. And so uh, he has said local control is lifting um, all of the mass mandates, even um, state state employees, local, all across. So he's leaving local control, but where there were mandates, pulling all those down and getting people back out and about. Great leadership out here. You know, I, I do think it actually requires some intentional messaging like that uh, to give people permission who might still need permission to go out and live their lives, who might still be scared, because I do think this trauma that we've all gone through is going to be something that we're going to have to work through for a period of time. You are not of state government initially. You come out of healthcare and uh, and have taken this position. And I think have uh, if people watch different states as we do, I think you've earned quite a reputation of of somebody who is uh, who knows where the skeletons are buried, knows how the system works, and is trying to uh, see, implement significant reforms on behalf of Coloradans in the, the healthcare space. So give us a sense of what you've been able to, you know, dig your teeth into. I know not everything is as successful as rapidly as everyone would want, but what, give us a sense of some of the reforms you have been putting in place. Sure. So um, lots of reforms. If you look at uh, equity being very, health equity being very, very important, um, affordability being tremendously important, access being important, 
uh, we even changed our mission as a department of healthcare policy and financing that oversees uh, Medicaid and the children's health insurance program and other safety nets to recognize we're serving one in four Coloradans. We're the biggest health plan in the state by far, and we have to be a better leader uh, in affordability for ourselves, Medicaid, because it's paid for by taxpayers, um, and it's a third of the state's budget, but also to drive affordability and policy for the rest of Colorado. So the governor created the Office of Saving People Money on Health Care, created a health cabinet, head of the health cabinet, was the lieutenant governor. She drives, leads the Office of Saving People Money on Health Care, and that pulls together the Department of Insurance and our department. Uh, and public health and environment and human services all working together. And uh, he's driving affordability. So some of the policy changes is, you know, lots of transparency around um, our hospital partners, uh, uh, how much cash on hand, what's the admin, what's the pricing compared to the rest of the country and driving prices in the right direction because that's 40 to 45 cents in the dollar. Lots of um, release of reports uh, around prescription drugs, that's 20 to 25 cents on the dollar. So how do we control drugs? So we're uh, trying to lead on importation of drugs and we have uh, just starting now a prescription drug affordability board to set up our payment limits. Let's drive rebates through. So lots of ways of controlling uh, costs and affordability. On the health equity front, uh, that's gotta drive our policy, the prevention part of health equity. The first uh, objective is vaccinating individuals. As Steve said, wow, um, our low income folks, which you know is under my auspices, we have a 27% gap of getting low-income people vaccinated compared to the state as an entirety. And we're right in line with the rest of the country, maybe even a little better uh, in some places. And that is, it's, it's shown a light on disparities. And we have just got to address that better as a society uh, overall. So we said uh, vaccinations and, and now our you know, focus on health equity, equity is first, but then maternity. We cover as a Medicaid agency and a children's health insurance program, which also covers pregnant women. We, um, we pay for 42 to 45% of the births in the state. And we did a big report last year and the disparities there are unacceptable. 250% higher chance of, of dying in, in birth if you're a black woman than a white woman, not okay. So we have set ourselves a second goal. Hey, let's go after uh, reform and health um, equity. So maternity um, uh, second, vaccinations first, behavioral health uh, third. Another reform is in that behavioral health area. Boy, did this shine a light on the enormous challenges we have in the behavioral health system all across the country. So massive money, 450 million in ARPA money we're channeling the behavioral health, created a BHA, bring in all the state uh, uh, departments together to do this better. So we're not operating in silos uh, with 19 priorities going at it together, um, trying to find best engine. So we're as an administrative engine gonna pay for human services. So we're, we're finding the best. We're also, hey, we've got to, if we're gonna close equity and behavioral health, we've got to. Uh, get it at, at uh, cultural competencies. Um, so when you think about reform, uh, definitely access, definitely uh, health outcomes and closing disparities, uh, definitely about affordability and uh, drive, 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 and for all of those things uh, going forward. So if people are just seeing you or getting to know you for the first time, uh, I think they can see the energy that you bring to this. Let's the, go. The passion. That's right. Uh, <laughs> On the topic of costs and transparency, um, what you, you have shined a light on the variation in, as you mentioned, pharmacy and hospital prices, particularly between rural and urban areas. On, on hospitals, what lessons would you offer to other states on how to uh, successfully drive a, a regime of transparency and collaboration that can actually move the system forward on cost control? So, uh, you know, transparency can... Uh, illuminate uh, a world of opportunity. And that's where we have started with in collaboration with our hospitals to say, all right, let's share the financials. Uh, let's share some pricing. Let's share your overhead. Let's uh, share that where do we rank in the country for construction? Um, and uh, you know, how many now trying to go forward? How many docks do you own? Uh, so we can really help illuminate um, what's your pricing compared to Medicare? And that partnership, it's been, it's, it's had some friction and some tension, uh, but you're not going to get any, you're not going to get progress unless you get, I mean, unless you illuminate, you point the laser and you ask for transformation. And the good news is a lot of what's come out of that is um, a recognition of where, where folks didn't realize how much of a problem we were in an outlier we were. And so um, I'm pleased to say that our hospitals have stepped up. They've, um, you know, we used to have average price increases between carriers and hospitals or self-funded plans and hospitals in that five to 7% range every year. 
It's dropped down to more like zero to three and 4%. Very proud and appreciative of our hospitals for recognizing that. Uh, we've had hospitals take an immediate action and lower prices in specific areas where they realize they're outliers. Um, we did something called HTP Hospital Transformation Program, and we took this big thing called the Chase Fee, about a billion dollars that is federal monies that help us make up for the shortfalls of Medicaid payments. And we transformed them into instead of just, hey, here's more money from Medicaid, uh, we're transforming them this past year into value based payments. So Hey, um, you built that standalone emergency room, which didn't do anything for the communities for affordability or outcomes. Transform it into how about a, how about a behavioral health site? How about a behavioral health and, and a primary care extended hour site? And we're actually paying them more to help them transform. So um, there's been some friction that comes out of that, as there always is with transparency. And you know, we've shown a light on ourselves as our own department. We've got to improve these things. Transparency brings around a, a, a world of improvement and. Uh, shining the light on what you need to do. And our hospitals are stepping up. There's more to do. And they always say, Kim, you're consistent. There's more to do. But um, I'm proud of uh, uh, the, direct, the tra trajectory that they're taking. Kim Bimsefer, the, C or the director of Colorado's Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing. Kim, thanks for making time to be with us. I appreciate it. You bet. Nice to be here. Next up, we have the CEO of Care Oregon, Eric Hunter. Uh, Care Oregon is the largest health plan in the Medicaid space in Oregon, and you guys do pretty interesting stuff out there as well. Eric, thanks for making time to be with us. DJ, thank you for having me. I appreciate joining these, uh, these amazing people, Kim and Steve. Uh, you can see the passion they have for the work, and hopefully we demonstrate as such. I'm not as demonstrative, um, but, uh, but I think we believe in the work the same. So thank you for having me. And you know, I just have to say, when I started here almost six years ago, it was a state of reform conference that really gave me the ability to early on access the leaders in Oregon and talk to people and build those relationships that have really served us well. So, so thank you. And then when you were talking Christmas movies, I really thought you were going to go to Die Hard, but you know, we, we won't start that debate here. So. We, uh, we, you know, remember the events at the Nakatomi Plaza uh, every year, uh, in addition to love actually. So, uh, so give us a sense of what, of the work that you're doing. Oregon has a unique yeah. CCO model that uh, uh, integrates, of course, behavioral health care and other uh, like dental lines of business, but also has a unique governance model that includes um, voices from the community. Give us a sense of how COVID is impacting the work that you're doing in Oregon. Yeah, no, thanks, DJ. I, you know, I think for Care Oregon, um, we really saw a crisis like COVID as devastating as it has been and continues to be really, frankly, for a lot of people as validation of the model that Oregon put forth under the leadership of Governor Kitzhaber years ago. Um, you know, Care Oregon itself was started like 28 years ago uh, by an FQHC and a teaching hospital as a vehicle to support the most vulnerable citizens in the shift to Medicaid managed care. And you know, we were initially just in Portland Metro, but we grew to have a statewide presence in Medicaid, Medicare, tribal care coordination, in-home primary care, palliative care hospice, for almost a half a million people but that work is primarily done through what you mentioned, the coordinated care organizations. And so these are uh, locally governed entities across the state that, that have leadership from uh, local hospital systems, you know, local payers. Uh, we have to have members on the boards of directors of these entities, right? We have to have practicing physicians. We have to have dental aspects. We have to have those things regulatorily a part of the decision making. And that really gave us the opportunity to say, when these things like COVID happen, we already have everyone at the table to come together and to move quickly to make things happen. And I think that's what Oregon was really able to do. Uh, some amazing work from the get-go collectively. And then we tried to supplement those things we could as Care Oregon, because we consider ourselves the safety net of the safety net. Um, so the combination of that and then great state leadership um, we've done very well in Oregon and we're very proud of our efforts out here. Give us a sense of how the vaccination um, conversation is taking place in Oregon and specifically, so I'm interested in some of the lessons learned around misinformation or how people have, you know, uh, challenges to uptake in vaccination. What, what are some of the experiences that you can share from that, uh, you know, that issue in Oregon? Yeah, I, I think like the others, we, we suffered from the same kind of uh, borderline 
delusional uh, sort of visions of what vaccines were that were driven by sort of political motive or urban versus rural divides, not, not based on science, not based on fact. We had to deal with that like others did. We also realized from the get-go that it wasn't always about people not wanting to be vaccinated. There truly were access issues. You know, when the vaccines first came even to Oregon, they were funneled through the hospitals, right? Which is great. The hospitals have access, you know, and they, they can get to folks. But, but what about the FQHCs? You know, what about community-based organizations that are getting to those folks uh, more directly who have a more direct relationship with underserved communities, our, our migrant populations, the, 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 Af the African-American populations, the Asian-American populations. So we, we made concerted efforts to work with the hospitals in the state to say, let's get the vaccines to where the people are. Right. And let's have a very coordinated communications plan and aggressive marketing campaign that wasn't about thou shalt do X. You must do Y. It was here's the science behind it. Here's how it helps you. Here's how it helps your family. Here's how it helps your community. And we really tried to couch it in the in the vein of, you know, maybe you're not doing it for you, but you're doing it for the immunocompromised neighbor you have. You're doing it for the child across the street. You're doing it for your grandmother in a nursing home. And that's really one of the ways we were able to turn the tide and get folks to recognize it, it's not a personal selfish decision all the time. You have to think about the community. And I think the CCO model helped us bring together to have a coherent, cohesive argument for that. And it was really successful for us. How well has COVID um, catalyzed the expansion of the CCO model into other lines of business, or has it maybe catalyzed not a broadening, but a deepening uh, within Medicaid? How has that had an impact on the CCO model? Well, I think the one thing is that, you know, like many places with the public health emergency and the ending of sort of redeterminations for Medicaid, uh, in Oregon, like in many places, we had about 300,000 people, we believe, that are on the Medicaid rolls now um, that may maybe shouldn't or be or you know, might have migrated off had we been doing redeterminations. So uh, one thing in Oregon is we've taken very seriously the thoughts about how do we maintain coverage for those people when the emergency ends, right? We can't have 300,000 people losing coverage and not prepared to go into the exchange or not have a mechanism to get back into Medicaid should they be so deserving or, or not have coverage. And, and our state leaders are being very aggressive in trying to come together with a program that would, that would provide a bridge program for folks to give them sort of a pathway to either the exchange or to staying in Medicaid so that they're covered. So we don't have this great drop off, which would not only impact those, those consumers and the members in their healthcare, but the delivery system as well. Right. If people are already engaging in care, uh, the hospitals and, and pharmacies and dental providers and acute care providers who are already hard hit, um, you know, to just have another drop off in utilization because folks aren't covered would sort of exacerbate existing problems we have in the system. So Oregon's being very aggressive in trying to say, you know, first off, let's make sure that we keep people covered. We're at about 95 percent coverage in Oregon. Uh, we were up to 96 before COVID, but I think we're doing still pretty well. And we want to keep it there because that's sort of the first step in making sure that people are taken care of is getting them covered, then engaging them in the right coverage. But, but we've been really aggressive in the states, had great leadership, Representative Rob Nose, uh, Representative Rachel Prusak out here in the state legislature, uh, Senator Lieber. Uh, it's, been, it's been really amazing. How would you say, or how do you expect COVID to have changed Care Oregon moving forward. What will you be doing differently because of the lessons learned from this experience that maybe you weren't doing back in 2019? Yeah, I, I think as I said, I think the, the the crisis enabled us to take advantage of things that we'd already developed or wanted to do, or had worked with our community partners to develop to move forward. Um, but now with the crisis, there was a catalyst for folks to actually buy in. Right. For example, uh, we've all talked about value-based payments, right? Getting away from a straight fee-for-service, treating people like widgets and getting payment for volume of services as not being the answer to really truly accountable, value-based, equitable health care. Um, what the crisis did was allow us to engage people differently and providers, particularly safety net providers, FQHCs, small providers, and giving them the technical assistance, the knowledge, the data, uh, the skills they need to manage their population more broadly 
and, and have value-based payment contracts, have capitation contracts, have more uh, guaranteed cash flow so they can get more creative. They can do more with their staff. They can do more to be proactive uh, with their membership and not just say, hey, I provide this service and bill for this code and get this dollar amount you know, two months later. And so I think that's been one of the biggest things. It's really changed the dynamic of the relationship between not just Care Oregon, but I think all of the systems in Oregon around Medicaid to understand that, that we, we truly do need to think about how we are integrating the care, the whole person care, and, and the payments associated with it. The, the other. You can't just give capitation and ignore sort of what's happening from a quality and utilization standpoint. It's got to be a combination conversation. And I think we've really driven towards getting a lot of momentum on that. So as folks from outside of Oregon, you know, they, they're looking in, they recognize Oregon has a different model, but what would you say are some of the key lessons that people outside of Oregon should take from the Oregon experience? Yeah, I, I think if if everyone can't do their own CCO model, right? I think there are a lot of states do um, Medicaid procurement in different fashions. I've been with a number of different companies in, I guess, eight states at this point uh, doing Medicaid management. Um, this model is designed to have everyone at the table uh, in a in a manner that's working together, not competing with each other for Medicaid lives, right? I think that's one of the important things. It's it's saying how do we look first for synergies in the systems, and then look for efficiencies, not the other way around. Uh, we have an Oregon and Oregon Health Leadership Council, which is an amazing group comprised of the, the CEO level leaders of all the health systems statewide, you know, all the trade associations for hospitals, for nurses, for, for physicians, FQHCs, all the payers, commercial and Medicaid. We get in a room at the CEO level and talk about the state of the state. We talk about how do we work together on HIT projects. We're currently uh, creating a new task force. It's gonna be led by John Hunter at OHSU to talk about how do we as leaders help the state define sort of what the, the workforce issues are and how we can address them collectively you know, throughout the system and what system has to be designed so that we're building a workforce that supports a system of next year, not a workforce that supports a system of five years ago, right? And so I think it's those kind of things which I've seen are different in Oregon. Uh, there's cooperation everywhere, but this is a different level where folks are able to put their egos aside and say, you know, let, let's find common ground. And we, you know, we had to create those tables. You know, it builds relationships. It lets us move quickly when there's a crisis because we know each other, we trust each other. And I think that's, that's the best uh, takeaway I've got out of it. Eric Hunter, the CEO of Care Oregon. Sir, thanks for doing this and being with us. I appreciate it. Thank you, DJ.